Hi, my name is Nancy J. Lee. I'm an actress, stand-up comedian, and I'm also a Korean American. If you laugh at a penny now, you'll cry for a penny later. 36436 is brought to you by The Late Night Experiment with Motown Maurice. Subscribe today on YouTube. So my parents are from Korea. Uh, they're both from South Korea. But back when they were born, it was actually one unified Korea. It was occupied by the country of Japan um, during the annexation for 35 years. And it was a hard time for Korean people. Um, whatever you want to believe on how it came to be annexed by Japan, uh, many Koreans rebelled and uh, Korean people weren't allowed to hold high positions. Most of them were manual laborers and didn't make very much money. So they were a hungry, poor country. And yes, Japan did help with building railroads and universities and all of that. But I think we all know that was for the benefit of the Japanese empire, not out of altruism for Korean people. Please, let's not be naive. So uh, after Japan lost World War II, uh, Russia and the US, who were allies at the time during World War I and II, they agreed to split Korea into two sections. Uh, so that's how it became North Korea and South Korea. But they couldn't agree on what kind of government uh, for them to have, of course, right? Russia wanted communism, whereas the US wanted a democracy. So in 1950, North Korea, armed by Russia, invaded South Korea. And um, they were not well armed, South Korea, at least at that time. So North Korea was advancing and it was really tragic because it was basically brother against brother. And it's a, it was a war in their own backyard. In the US, we can't even imagine what that's like. Uh, the last time that happened was the Civil War. So no one remembers that. Um, and that would be like, you know, I live in Southern California, my brother lives in Northern California, a line being drawn in, in between, and I would have to fight against my own family. I can't even imagine, I'd rather kill myself than go through that. But they had to do that in Korea. And because of the war, the results were millions had died, thousands of people died of starvation, and they were refugees. And my own family's tragedies were that my mother's father, who was a lieutenant in the army, he actually volunteered to go back and fight, even though he was relieved of his duty. And of course, he died during the war, so I never met him. My mom was only six years old, and my grandmother was basically a single mother. And back then, there was no such thing as aid for a single mother or wealth or anything like that. And then my father's side, uh, his own father, when my dad was only about 12 or 13 years old, his dad disappeared. They had no idea what happened to him. They're assuming that he was probably killed by the North Korean troops. And he had four younger brothers and sisters at that time. And uh, his brother and sister, who were about uh, the ages of three and five, they both passed away from hunger. So uh, the sadness and the pain of all of that uh, was with them during that time. And I'm sure that kind of hurt and pain doesn't go away very easily. So that's the kind of Korea they grew up in. And technically speaking, the war hasn't really ended. They only signed a ceasefire in 1953. So there are still those tensions and that scare of being invaded again by North Korea. So my parents had decided to leave Korea and it's not the typical story like, oh, they wanted a better life for themselves. They were actually both extremely highly educated. My father went to Seoul National. He was at the top of his class. That's like Harvard in Korea. And then my mom went to Yonte, which is like a Columbia. They were very well educated. They were doing fine. And uh, my dad actually worked for Hyundai. I think we all know that company now. Um, but the main reason they came over is my mom told me she convinced him to come over because she was scared that he was going to turn into a monster. Like too much power, his friends had so much power, they were in the government, uh, they owned blocks and city blocks of land and malls. So uh, my parents, if they stayed in Korea, probably would have been extremely rich, but my mom didn't want that kind of life. So they came over in the 70s with my younger, with my older brother, sorry, with my older brother. And then I was born in San Francisco. I'm not gonna tell you which year because I'm not gonna age myself, it's Hollywood. But I was born in San Francisco, and of course that makes me an American citizen, but 
it didn't matter that I spoke English and watched TV and had American friends. In our house, we were raised like we were in Korea. And education, of course, was the most important thing and not wasting food. My grandmother would say things like, you know, in Korean, she would say, if you waste even one grain of rice, God is going to punish you. I mean, that's so extreme. You're scared and you believe it when you're a little kid. And then my friend's dad, who was also from Korea, would say things like, if you don't finish every grain of rice, you're not my son. Extreme, right? It's ridiculous, but that's how we were raised because they came from war torn Korea where um, people died of starvation. They saw their own siblings die. So I remember this one time in sixth grade, my mom had packed me some lunch, and of course, it was Korean food. I'm such an ingrate now looking back at the fact that she had made it with her own hands and it was good, real food. I just wanted to buy tater tots and corn dogs and be like every other American kid, but you know, thinking, you know, that this is healthier, better food for me. She packed it up in a Tupperware, but the Tupperware back then was not so good, didn't seal in all the freshness, and she just put it in a brown paper bag. So I was too embarrassed to eat it at lunchtime. So I would just starve during lunch, and then because I couldn't throw away the Tupperware or the food or else I'd be punished by God or my parents, I just kept it with me all day long, and I took it with me on the bus, and of course the smell was leaking out and I was sitting in the back of the bus with all the cool kids and I was almost at my bus stop but there's this one kid named Marcus and he was hilarious and funny and just he knew how to clown people you were so afraid of him because he just know he just knew how to make you feel like the biggest idiot so he starts sniffing around the bus and he's like <laughs> Ugh, what's that smell? And of course I knew it was my food. It was this seaweed rice called kimbap. It's a Korean version of sushi and we all know that stinks. And back then it was not cool to eat sushi. Little white kids now use chopsticks and bring sushi to school. But back then the most foreign food we ate was Taco Bell. That was it. So I was like, please God, don't let him smell my food and take it away from me and embarrass me. I didn't know what he could do to me, but I just didn't want him to find it. And I, I was almost at my bus stop, but then he grabbed the Tupperware from me, took it out of the bag dramatically, opened up the lid and said, Ugh, what the hell is this? My blood was boiling and he awoke the beast in me because I thought you are humiliating me. I felt like Bruce Lee when he was like, you will have offended my family and the Shaolin Temple. I got real Bruce Lee and angry. And so I took the Tupperware and smashed it in his face and the kimbap was trickling down his face and body and now he stunk like what he abhorred so much and I was so proud of myself but I was also scared because I was like, oh my God, what is he gonna do to me? Oh my God, I didn't expect that to come out of myself. So he got pissed and threw the Korean sushi at me and there was just basically a big kimbap food fight in the back of the bus. And the poor bus driver, I'm sure he had to clean it all up but I was so embarrassed and just enraged that I just got off the bus but from that day on, Marcus never bothered me again. And now we're Facebook friends, so it's all cool. <laughs> Everybody remembers that story. It was epic. My best friend at that time told me she uh, said it changed her life. And obviously it changed mine because I felt pretty brazen after that situation. <laughs> So the sixth grade food fight, unfortunately, was not the only instance where we had to be humiliated or I had to be humiliated. Later in my adult life, I remember this specific situation where we went to dinner. It was a nice place. My whole family was there along with two friends that were visiting from LA. And the waiter had come over and dropped off the bread. We were like, oh, sir, this has mold on it. So he profusely apologized and was about to take it away. But my mom held on to the basket and said, oh, it's OK. I cut around it. And we're like, mom, give him the basket back so he can get his new bread. She's like, why? What's the big deal? So she got mad at us. And we just thought, oh, when is this war mentality going to end? And I was so embarrassed in front of my friends, but they couldn't stop laughing and it was just a fun time but I'm so traumatized by all of this. <laughs> I am a stand-up comedian as well, and I do talk about the struggles of how I'm treated, how I still face racism till this day. People treat me like a foreigner, even though I was born and raised here, I speak English. 
I vote, I believe in the Constitution, I pay my taxes, I'm a really good citizen, and I'm a good driver. <laughs> but people still want to stereotype me and just assume this and that, and obviously that's just ignorance and prejudice. Uh, but I do hope to actually bring a script I've been writing out to fruition so I can have a feature length film to showcase what my life was like. And I think a lot of people relate, not only if they're from an immigrant family, but if they just have ever had feelings of being an outcast, not being respected for who they are. Um, and of course, many of us have been judged uh, according to our race or according to our gender, and whatever else makes us different. But I want to celebrate that and make that a positive thing because I have many different kinds of friends and I think that's one of the benefits of growing up in San Francisco where there was so much diversity and now living in Los Angeles. It's pretty awesome. I appreciate it. It's so much fun. Um, it's never boring, ever boring here. So I hope that works out and I could stop working my five jobs. Seriously. <laughs> so I was also in the late night experiment with Motel Maurice and the episode was called Self-Deprecation Season 6 Episode 5 and I played the Roast Master, just another version of myself and boy did we deprecate Motown. What a good sport. I don't think I could do anything like that where I display all of my faults I guess I would say or just tease myself, but man, that was harsh. Are you okay, Motown? I hope so. <laughs> Welcome to Mediocre Celebrity Roast, where tonight we will honor a man who has absolutely no friends or Twitter followers. <laughs> the more you learn about Motown Maurice, the more you realize how pathetic he is. <laughs> <laughs> You should watch The Late Night Experiment because there are so many cool episodes to watch. I was in one of them. You'll definitely learn something and you'll laugh a lot. Uh, there's so much crap out there on YouTube, but this is good stuff and Motown's hilarious and he does really wild different things with this series. It's unique. Now this is a tale of a late night host. He's strong, he's brave, he's sure. His name is Motown Maurice. Subscribe and please explore. Subscribe and please explore.